Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is DK Bhattacharya and I will be talking about tool types and techniques of Neolithic period. At the outset I must clarify that the Neolithic period is defined on the basis of certain attributes of technology as also economy. But somehow these are not universally applicable. You have many sites where you do not find all the three attributes together. Anyway, going by the definition, the three attributes which are imperative for defining a culture as Neolithic are as follows. Number one, it has to have seed which can be done uh, in a paleobotany lab. It cannot be de it can be defined as having been created by what is known as homogeneous planting and domestication. So, the, the presence of a domesticated seed is imperative in defining the culture as Neolithic period. In the same way, the presence of pottery is also taken as imperative for defining Neolithic culture. And the third attribute which is taken as imperative for defining Neolithic culture is the presence of a celt. A celt is a Neolithic stone tool. Fourth and final is uh, the evidence of permanent habitation for Neolithic period is also a very important attribute of defining it. It must be em emphasized that 400,000 years ago we have evidence of permanent structure being made in, in French Riviera at a site called Tiramata. Similarly, we have the evidence of permanent structure having been made in uh, Sarai Naharai and you know that it is dated to 9000 BC. So, we do have one or two evidence of permanent structure having been made before the Neolithic culture, but by and large the evidence of permanent structure is taken as evidence of Neolithic on the ground that if you are doing farming, you have to stay put at one place for at least 90 days before the seeds are ripened and they are dried and you can do the harvesting of the seed. So, you cannot just leave your plants and go away elsewhere and therefore by implication and logic you must be creating some kind of a permanent structure. And the permanent structure always is taken as daub and mostly in India at least daub and wattle, wattle and daub structure. Wattle and daub is you take dried branches of trees and bushes and make a net of it and then plaster mud from both the sides to create a wall. This kind of structure has been found in all early Neolithic and even early Chalcolithic sites in India. Having said as much as a definitional attribute, we must look at the word Stone Age axe, which is called a celt, C E L T. A Stone Age axe is taken as determining evidence or definitional evidence of a Neolithic culture on the ground that a, a culture where you have first taken to clearing a virgin forest, a virgin forest needs to be cleared for making a kind of a farmland where sun can reach the ground. You see, in kind of a forested region, the canopy of the trees are such joined that the sun cannot reach the ground. So, the first thing that you require in order to make a plant, a place or a farming land where sun can reach is to cut a tree. How can you cut a tree without having any metal implements? Now this was something which is enigmatic. For a long time we have been accepting no, farming was done along river beds where some monsoonic uh, overflow had created some silt and a little strip of thing could be uh, uh, used to create a, one kind of a crop. But it's not true because the moment you take into farming, your population increases in an exponential manner. 4 becomes 16 and 16 becomes 256. So, your exponential increase of the population means that you have to constantly increase the, the withdrawal of the subsistence base from the land and you constantly require a larger farmland. And if you require a larger farmland, you have no other alternative but to cut the tree. How do you cut a, a, a live tree? without having any metal implement. It is argued that they created a kind of stone tool which is called a stone axe by a very very uh, systematic method. They picked up a stone and then created a kind of a hand axe of the lower paleolithic kind by taking flakes out. And the flakes have been taken out good enough. Then you, you, what you do is that you use a pecking technique by taking a cylinder hammer and and break the ridges between the two scars. If the two scars are meeting at a point, there will be a ridge and you break the ridges. So, it is called pecking. So, flaking and then that is pecking and after pecking has been done, it looks something like this. 
it has become smooth and you can't see the intersection of the scars then you put sand and water on granite slabs and rub it and this rubbing has been called as grinding and polishing some people believe that polishing is a separate technique no grinding and polishing is a term used in conjugation to mean that grinding to done in order to create a polished surface you can see the polished surface so you have a large amount of sites in many sites where you have found big stones granites in which grooves parallel grooves are there and you know in these groups that these groups have been created by constantly rubbing these tools in order to create a sharp border. Now this sharp border that has been created is so sturdy, almost comparable, it is so sturdy that it is almost comparable to a metal axe. Now this is called a Neolithic silt. I repeat again, a Neolithic silt is prepared by first flaking and then pecking and then grinding and polishing. It is incidentally important for us to know that this implement is taken so cardinal to human civilizational growth, I repeat, so cardinal to human civilizational growth that in the papal headquarter in Vatican, the, the emblem has a kind of a man holding a celt. A celt has been taken symbolically as the first step towards the development of civilization because you become sedentary, you create agriculture, you have a surplus and you have a culture so the beginning of a village occurs and it goes on and on. Many authorities believed, many authorities believed that these were primitive plow. This is wrong. Plow agriculture occurs at least 2000 years after first agriculture begins. You have silt coming from 6000 BC, 5000 BC and plow agriculture is not available till about 2500 BC. So plow agriculture is that stage where you have a kind of a political imperative to cross the limit of production beyond culturally limited, culturally determined limit. So you have a culturally determined limit. I am 50 people or we are 50 people who require so much of food. So we will prepare so much. But the political power comes and says, no, you prepare more than 50 people's requirement. You prepare 500 people's requirement. So a kind of a power structure develops and the power structure asserts the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the rest of the food and leaving the amount that has been used by the 500 people in the group, the rest of the amount is used for power. So plow agriculture comes much later. So some people originally felt that these were the primitive plows. I don't think that is really true. These were the axe with which big trees were cut. And after big trees were cut, the sun could reach the ground. Of course, there are, there are bushes around and they could be set fire. So you, bushes can be cleared by setting them on fire. So a kind of a, a land, a farmland can be created. Not only this, you find very interesting evidence, very interesting evidence of this kind of rubbing stones, this kind of rubbing stone and you know at once that the harvested seed, let us say barley or wheat used to be rubbed in order to make flour. And we have found rubbing stones which is called saddle and quarry or just grinder. We find many of these grinding stones in Neolithic settlement. So you start seeing that the tools that are, that, are, that are prepared here in Neolithic period are for secondary processing of food. Please remember, preceding to this culture, all the tools were for primary retrieval of resource. And here, Besides primary retrieval of resource, you have secondary processing of them. Processing of the material that has come from the harvest needs to be ground, polished and so on and so forth. Another thing that keeps coming from many Neolithic sites is a very interesting uh, rounded, rounded, specially rounded flat stone in which a hole has been made. Mind you, it is stone and there is no metal discovered. It is pre-metal. So how a stone has been uh, given a hole in it, it is believed quartz or some rough stone has been used and rubbed around to make this hole. Now imagine so much of labor put in for making a piece like this. Nobody knows what its function could be. But it was argued that they could be used for 
threshing the tools, uh, threshing the harvest. So you put a stone, a uh, wooden stock in it, and then you beat the harvest so that the chaff is separated from the grains. And today in many parts of Ariana, they make bulls or, or buffaloes to walk on the, on, the, on, the, on the harvested material so that the chaff can be separated from the grains. So they are called harvester or, or, or maize head, maize, M-A-C-E, maize head. But the interesting point is that these ring stones, they are called ring stones, and these ring stones are not of the uniform shape. You go to the eastern India, many of the ring stones become as small as this. Now, small ring stones could have been used for harvesting material or harvesting the material. It was used possibly as, as, as sinking stones in a, in a net. So if in a, you are using net for fishing, you require stones to make the net sink down. So you require small, small stones to make it sink down. And it is argued that those small ring stones are used as sinkers in net, nets. It's true that in the eastern sites, you don't have material which needs to be harvested in this manner. You have rice. Rice can be harvested in a different manner. We do not know. So a Neolithic silt is an axe which is made by the three stages of flaking and then pecking and then grinding and polishing. Along with that, you start getting the ring stones and then a fourth object or third object that is grinders, varieties of grinders. Some of the grinders have become concave by repeated grinding on the floor and on the concave base you have a hole already. That means it has become so thin that it has become, it has uh, broken down into small hole. So you have grinding as a very active uh, working of Neolithic economy. But along with that we have to accept that the silts are also not really of uniform size and shape. There is one kind of silt which is which is which is plano convex. Now the silt that I am talking of is bi biconvex. It is biconvex. And this is typically an axe. You can use it as an axe. But there are silts which are found to be plano convex. And if it is plano convex, one side convex, the other side plane, it is believed that they have been hefted in an angular handle so that they can work as an adze, A D Z E, like this. That the working axis, the working axis is at right angle to the working border. If the working border is like this, the working axis is like this. Unlike an axe, when the working border and the working axis are on the same plane. So an axe works like this and adze works like this. So you have many adze which have a flat under surface and a convex this surface. One of the adze, one of the adze is a very elongated body. And this has been called shoe last silt. Shoe last silt, meaning thereby that possibly this was added to a angular handle as a shoe will be in a plow. A plow has a tip which is called the shoe of the plow. So possibly the fixation in the mind of archaeologists, early archaeologists has been always that these are plow shares. These are used to do plowing. I am trying to say that it is difficult to prove that plow, plow agriculture was there before 2000 BC. The plow, and though farming or Neolithic begins in 6000 BC. So 4000 years is thousands of generations. 20 years is taken as one generation. So you can see 4000 years is a lot of time. And I don't think these were evolved because of plowing or used as plow. They are used to cut the forest, the virgin forest. For the first time, man is trying to open the forest for the sun to come and reach the farming land and you can do farm, uh, farm uh, economy. So the uh, material that we find in Neolithic period has to be not compared in terms of technomorphological variegated uh, development as we have in Mesolithic or in Paleolithic. It has to be seen in terms of variegated functions. We know that Neolithic economy is one which may not be universal all around. There may be one Neolithic economy happening, let us say, at 6000 BC in Gorakhpur, in a site called Lahura Deva. And there may be another Neolithic economy in Saran district of Bihar. And the date is 1800, 6000 BC, 1800. In other words, the decision to do farming 
is entirely upon the community. It doesn't mean the whole over India has to convert themselves into Neolithic economy on the same day. No. Otherwise, there would not have been hunter-gatherers present even today. Even today, you have Birhors in Bihar who are hunter-gatherers. That doesn't mean that Neolithic has not come to them yet. The point is, the choice to taking a farming economy is not universal. The choice of taking to farming economy depends on several factors. And one of the most important factors is social control. If a band of people, because it is a labor-intensive economy, and if it is a labor-intensive economy, there are a large number of people who have to be brought into the labor pool. And the labor pool, if two hands come, with every two hands comes a mouth. So if you borrow hands and ask them, please help me in my agriculture, then everyone who is giving their labor will say, what about my share? How much do I get? So management of the labor, so that there is no re revolution in the labor pool, there is no terrorism in the labor pool, if the social control of the labor, if it is success, then only Neolithic becomes a success. Otherwise, Neolithic, everybody can't do. We have many sites. There is a site called Tel Muribad in Syria, where the layer, lower layer is Neolithic, the upper layer is pastoral. They couldn't sustain it. Neolithic couldn't be sustained unless the social control or social management or human management has been mastered. So it is a classic evidence of, of like business management, classic evidence of labor management. It is believed that labor management can be sometimes done by way of, uh, let us say, power, a sword. We have evidence in Syria, uh, not in Syria, in Iraq, uh, Sumeria, where you find mil militarization. So with the power of sword, they have brought slaves and slaves acted as labor. But then we have evidences which, where there is no power of sword used and a symbiotic relationship is taken. I'll give you an example. Marriage as an institution becomes very important method of getting kinship obligatory labor. You say, oh, brother-in-law is having harvest, let us go and help him. So a obligatory labor immediately becomes available where you don't have to seduce them or you don't have to pay them. So this is kind of different variegated development of social institutions. But what I'm trying to say in terms of Marxian economy, social development precedes agriculture. Social management technique precedes agriculture. And the point that I have to pay back the pay back the labor is so important that in India, in many areas, even today, you have the word written on, on, on roadside uh, shops where it is said dharam kata. Dharam kata means, say, honest, honest balance, honest, religiously committed balance. I commit the honesty of balancing the right amount to give it back to you. So the assurance of returning redistribution of the produce becomes cardinal to the success of eco Neolithic economy. Neolithic economy cannot become in, uh, successful unless you develop a very, very important social system by way of which you can assure the lab labor, don't worry, you will get your share. Don't worry, I, pr I will pay you back, dharam kata. And this paying back assurance is the crux of development of Neolithic economy, which otherwise cannot be proved in archaeology. In no archaeological excavation, you can prove that this kind of labor management was successfully operated. It is implied. In other words, if you find a layer where archaeologically you can show very successful Neolithic economy, you can almost assume that this community had developed a very important mannerism of managing the labor. The labor is so important because it is a labor intensive economy. You can't do agriculture on your rooftop. You can't do agriculture on flower pots. You have to have huge amount of help to help you creating or up to the harvest time to creating the produce and, and storing it in kind of uh, storages. There is a site in Ukraine where you find large number of rooms and in the courtyard is the harvest uh, granary. Now, this is a very important evidence that has been taken to prove that the granary was or the harvest was a common property to large number of families. And they did not take their share in their respective rooms. It was kept in the courtyard. 
this is almost similar to what you can see in large joint family where each of the family take their own material out from the general harvest. We have impressed upon the fact that Neolithic develops at its own imperative depending on whatever area we are dealing with. The, basically the economy and the population and the social system which can control the population. That's very important crux of the whole matter. If the population cannot be controlled then they continue using Mesolithic and of course with Mesolithic there will be material taken from by symbiotic relationship from farmers uh, uh, from the neighborhood. We have classic examples of the western Maharashtra sites of Gilund and, and, and many other sites Kayatha where you find 90% material is uh, microliths with large number of handmade pottery. So you have to call them Neolithic because there is pottery but you know that they are being having some kind of symbiotic relationship. In the same way you have the entire eastern material especially along uh, east of Brahmaputra in Assam and the adjoining seven states uh, where you find uh, the cells becomes very small the cells become not only small, they also start developing a kind of a shoulder towards the butt end. So you have a shouldered celt, the transverse anterior end is a celt like anterior end, but the butt end has a uh, double shoulders uh, made and these double shoulders definitely show as if they have been hefted. It's likely that they have been hefted in angular handles so that they can act as, as kind, of, uh, kind of plow or kind of uh, hoe to scrape the ground whatever but the point is they are also not very massive it's a very interesting development which needs to be paid at most attention which we have not adequately paid the attention that we need to pay is why this kind of smaller and shoulder cells develop in the part of eastern or northeastern part of india because shoulder cells are also found across the border in thailand and indonesia so it seems to be a population contiguity or movement of the same kind of people but the adjustment to the ecosystem is a very important point. They had no longer the need of cutting big trees. They had the need to cut the shrubberies. They had the need to scrape the ground because rainwater was plenty. But there was no development of a large scale Neolithic site here. So large scale Neolithic site does not develop at places which has large amount of rainfall. This is a very interesting point that needs to look into. And you try to see the Neolithic sites of let us say Navdatuli or Neolithic site of let us say Laura Deva or Chirand, large expanses of area which let us say 60 to, 60 to 55 degree um, uh, um, inches rainfall a year and reasonably uh, long period of dry, lot of sun and you have a kind of beautiful uh, one crop very easily brought out if you can handle the population. What is important is to have a kind of a social control on the population, the labor that you have borrowed. And this kind of a labor control seems to have been mastered already by 6000 BC in the northern part of India. But eastern part of India, it seems to be part of uh, a lineage doing jhum cultivation, scraping the borderland or the slopes of land of the, of the herbs and various shrubberies and creating their own kind of mixed plantation. So here is a development which needs to be understood not with a magnum large term called Neolithic techniques and types but in terms of Neolithic of the variegated forms on the various kinds of ecosystem adaptation. You have varieties of ways in which ecosystem adaptation is visible in India. Whole of South India as a Deccan Neolithic which you have already talked of and you know Deccan Neolithic development is entirely pastoral based and it is of entirely different kind from those of the northern India. So Neolithic per se is alright it's a word we use to mean productive economy but it still doesn't say that the productive economy will be of uniform kind all over the ecosystem. So what is the master of the drama is the ecosystem. And what is the master of the drama is the population that creates a kind of a social management to handle that ecosystem which they have ch chosen for their adaptation. You don't have a large village in whole of Assam. You have small sites. You do not get large village settlements like you get in Chirand or you get in Laura Deva. 
we need to go back to South India. Suddenly, when you talk about Neolithic types and techniques, you cannot just stop at North India or East India. You need to pay some attention to the large landmass from, say, Narmada down to almost Kaveri, which is a large landmass of India, having a very specific kind of adaptation called Deccan Neolithic. Now, in the Deccan Neolithic, the cells are massive. The point is, if they were pastoral, what were they doing with the cells? And we have hundreds of varieties of cells coming from Deccan Neolithic, where the button is blunted, button is bigger and not pointed, button is broad and not pointed. It of course proves nothing except for the fact that how they were hafted. Hafting must have been done in a specific manner. But the point that is important to see is that Deccan soil is a very, very thin layer of secondary deposit over the basalt or, or the Deccan trap. Deccan trap is a strong base of rock on which a thin, uh, thin veneer of soil is available. And this thin veneer of soil cannot give you an intensive production economy. It may have given you a production economy which could be of a sustainable nature and no wonder they chose ragi and hulgi and millets. And you can see that they are collecting large amount of date palms, khajur, and that means they are still not given up their habit of hunting and gathering. So they are still gathering uh, date palm, and we have uh, horse grain, gram, and we have ragi and hulgi and millets, but not wheat, not barley. So you have wheat and barley is not impossible to plant unless you winter rain, and there is no winter rain in in, in Deccan Plateau. So this is a rain shadow area where half of the rain of the eastern monsoon and the western monsoon is taken by the two ghats, and the mid plain remain basically 25 inches or 22 inches. This is a very arid zone, and this arid zone was possibly acceptable to them, or when they chose adaptation to them, they took to pastoralism. Pastoralism requires a kind of small veneer of land with little grassland on top. So you have a huge amount of grassland available, and this was the subsistence base chosen by people in southern India. Another important thing that needs to be accepted is that when you have agriculture, you, you have to have some kind of very strong inheritance law. Agriculture means every generation the land cannot be divided into the children. So by the time the next generation comes, the land becomes the size of a biscuit. So what they do, they create a very specific kind of inheritance law where agriculture is successful. I am talking about the social control. So the agriculture uh, people will develop a kind of social control where they say, no, you have a mitakshara system or a dayabhaga system or a primigeniture system where the eldest son will inherit the land, land cannot be divided, the produce can be divided. But when you come to pastoralism, you have 20 cows and you're, you have to say seven children or two, five children. You give each one of them a, a pair of a, a cow and a bull. You give them when they are getting married. By the time they have their first child born, the two will become four. And by the time the child is wanting to separate out, the four will become 16. So you see one point in pastoralism is that the subsistence base is elastic. It multiplies itself. And you don't have to have very rigorous inheritance law. You go to northern India where agriculture has been successful. My God, the amount of rigorosity of the law, Pindudana, and the kind of inheritance that is maintained by the village is very rigorous. But you come to the pastoral group, and you have similar sites, uh, evidences from Middle East also. With the pastoral group, they are less fair in their inheritance law. You have large amount of cows and bulls. You can share some with the children. The children will see them multiplied in the course of time. So the point I am trying to make again is that the social system, not only the tools, the social system also kind of suits itself to the ecosystem to which you have chosen to adapt. You have chosen to adapt in an ecosystem where you can grow some kind of sturdy, sturdy, uh, uh, drought resistant crop like ragi and hulgi, that is Dolichus biflorus, and that you have a small harvest, you can't have an intensive harvest. And after the harvest is over, you 
set fire to the cow dung and you start moving with a flock to give them grazing land in the uphills. And you more you go towards the northern limits of Narmada, you have more rainfall available, so you have more of green grass available. You come back when they have their winter, you come back to your place and again you start getting another crop and the, the ash that is created by your setting fire to the cow dung has cleared the land and you have your cows, cows and uh, buffaloes kept in the pen. So it's a kind of a cyclic thing that has developed in an area which is a specific ecosystem. So the crux of the issue of Neolithic is what ecosystem has one chosen? And depending on what ecosystem one has chosen for subsistence base, the agriculture or the farming that is done is according to that. And we have classic example of Eastern India where shoulder silts are available. You have classic example of Southern India where pastoralism develops. And you have classic example of Northern India, especially Mid Ganga Valley where Laura Deva and Tiran, we have large expanse of development of a kind of wheat and rice and, uh, and other crops. Also a large amount of uh, dal. Uh, pulses that come from Chiran is developed in the middle Ganga. So you have a complex village developing in North India, but you never have a village developing either in East India or in Southern India. Thank you.